hello and welcome everybody to uh, day two of the Acre at ANU conference. You're joining us for one of our workshops today and the workshops about polishing your work. Um, and our presenter will be Ms. Gillian Shednick from our academic skills team here at the ANU. Um, I would like to start off just by paying my respects to the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people of the Canberra region and extend that respect to First Nation Australians on whose traditional lands we're all meeting today um, and just extend that um, acknowledgement to their elders past and present and just recognize that they are the oldest continuing culture in human history. Um, my name is Ash Dowling. I'm the Deputy Manager Student Development with the Engagement and Success Team here at ANU um, and part of the Organising Committee for ACRE um, at ANU 2021. Um, welcome everyone and we hope you're enjoying the conference so far and I will hand over to our presenter Gillian Shednek who will take you through um, some content to help you to look at polishing up your, your work. Thanks Gillian. Yep, great. Thank you. Thank you, Ash. I'll just share my screen now and we'll be looking at some slides for editing and polishing your work. Thanks for coming along, everybody. And those of you watching later on video, um, it's been great. I was a judge for some of your conference presentations and that was really fun to see the work you've done. And I reviewed some of your submissions for the conference and that was really fun too. So it's great to to be a part of this and learn all about all the different work that undergrads and postgrad coursework students are doing. It's really amazing. And now we'll be thinking about editing and polishing your work, going through a process for how to do that. If you guys have any questions as I'm going along, pop that in the chat or you can raise your hand um and that might work and <laughs> ash or rubai in the background might help out with that if that occurs or just write your question in the chat and i can definitely easily see that um and yeah please let me know as i'm going if there's anything that comes up as a question for you um i'd be happy to answer that as i'm talking but as we're um, thinking about editing and polishing your work want you to think about what do readers want out of your academic writing or when you're reading academic writing, what do you want to really most of all get out of it like what's most important to you. Um, as a reader, or what do you think readers most want out of your writing. Um, so let's think about that let's think about what that might be I have a little list here that I will unveil oh, there's something in the chat, let me just check oh, it's, it's Ruban cool. Thank you, Ruba. Okay, so thinking about what's most important, I think it's along these lines. This is often what you see for your rubric. If you're thinking about writing for a course and how it's marked, it's often um, with this criteria in this order so that your argument and your key message is first of all, the most important thing that carries the most weight in your mark. It's also, if you're thinking about submitting to an academic journal, that's also the most important thing. If you're thinking about writing a chapter for your honors or for uh, a master's thesis or something like that, your argument and key message is also the most important thing. So this is universal, mostly what I'm talking about um, for all of you and all the different uh, situations you might be in when you're thinking of um, submitting or in any, in any sense, uh, your academic writing to be marked or to be published. Um, so thinking about that argument and key message, you know, it often says in your rubric, a strong use of research as seconds, you know, how you're using your evidence and how you're supporting your argument. And, you know, that goes along with your structure. Your structure goes along with both of those things your argument and then how that is played out in the structure of your essay report article whatever you want to call it and then you know the lesser could very important but um you know sort of less important in terms of the weight of your mark um is that referencing and that expression of course that needs to be there it needs to be done well but the key things that are the most important in terms of decisions around publication or around getting, um, you know, a high mark that you might want has to do with that argument key message research and structure at the top tier and of course 
the other two have to be there as well. But those are the harder things to really referencing is more of something, you know, that you can tick off a box. Expression is also something to work on, but it can only be done. You can only think about expression when you have your argument set out well, when you have your structure set out well, um, and when you're using research well to support your argument. So we'll be going through more of that and thinking through more of that. But I just want to draw your attention to this very, what I think of as a very helpful table around your reader and what your reader wants. So remember, we were thinking before about what your reader wants, right? What you want and um, as a reader and what your reader wants out of your work. So let's think about that a little bit more deeply in terms of those expectations for English academia. Um, so as we can see in that column, English academic readers, you are one of them as well. You probably want all these things also, but probably didn't think about it as deliberately as this table shows us us wanting specific detail, precise language, right? No ambiguity. We're uncomfortable with that. We're uncomfortable feeling really puzzled. We're uncomfortable filling in the gaps um, of what you mean. What are your logic leaps? We often, you know, if you just present us with facts, we're not going to then, oh, that relate to your argument in this way. We don't want to do that. We're uncomfortable doing that. We want to make, we want to know exactly what you mean and how that evidence relates in your own language that you present to us in your writing. Um, so we don't want that ambiguous phrasing, um, you know, just ambiguous pronouns like this or it get co quite confusing. Um, we don't often know exactly what that means, what that refers to. It makes us uncomfortable as academic readers. Um, and what is meant is what is said. So there's no poetic implication. I mean, it can be, but often that's not what we expect. And so then thinking about that other column, other reading expectations outside of English academia. This could mean another language, right? This could mean academia in, you know, outside of English language. This could also mean other types of English language writing in terms of poetry, creative writing, um, journalism, all those other types of writing we might do in English, um, you know, might fall under more of this category, comfortable with that less direct communication. We can fill in those gaps. We can, um, you know, figure out that vague ambiguous language and and that can be fine for a lot of other genres it's just that academic language um, english academic readers their expectations you know we have these um different expectations uh so that's what you want to be thinking about as you're doing your writing for for academia you want to be thinking about how can i be as specific and precise as possible how can i lay everything out in a really clear logical order, make all those connections really explicit around what my key message is, how my evidence supports it, because I know my readers are going to feel uncomfortable and puzzled trying to figure out what I mean. I need to tell them exactly what I mean with my sentences. Okay, so thinking more again about academic English, you know, what are these expectations of a reader? We want to know your argument, your key message at the very beginning, in that depending on how long it is in the first paragraph or the second paragraph. We want to be reminded, we want it to be reinforced throughout your text, in your topic sentences, in your concluding sentences. And this goes, you know, pretty much across the board for all kinds of academic writing um, at all types of levels. And you want to reinforce that message and its implications at the end. We don't want to lose that thread. We don't want to hear what the argument is at the beginning, then be told a lot of facts, and then have the argument reinforced at the end and say, this is what I was saying all that time. We need it to be reinforced throughout the body as well. Okay, so thinking about how an argument is developed. Um, just breaking it down a little bit more clearly in terms of your introduction, that can be one or two paragraphs, depending on the total word length. Um, and it's going to have these four moves in a little while. We'll look at these four moves more closely in an example. And this is really what you want to follow. This is really the best way to convey and lead into your argument and introduce um, your entire key message and your structure. So you want to have start broad, give that context, give that issue or debate, give that argument, and outline how you're going to develop that argument. And we have that nice narrowing in, and then the body um, fulfills that kind of narrow scope, narrower scope. The trick is thinking about what is the right context to frame it as, and what is the right issue that then leads into your argument. And we'll look at some examples of that. But sometimes the students have this, but it's not quite lining up. So you have to think about how all this is going to align. You might start with your key message and say, 
what is the issue or debate and what is that context so that it all has a nice clear line. Um, you can have all four of these things, but sometimes they don't align. So I want to be thinking about how they can really clearly align. And once you've got that worked out, thinking about, and you can be writing this way, you can write everything down and then edit in this way and that's kind of what we're talking about later in the editing strategies making sure you've done all this or you know you can think about how to do it at the very beginning when you start composing that's up to you and your writing process but thinking about those body paragraphs maybe you have some headings if it's a longer piece um, but you certainly will always have topic sentences you want them to clearly introduce each reason and point that you've signaled in number four the outline of the logical development so have 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 that step through in those body paragraphs and maybe sections of your essay um, or whatever type of academic writing it is and you want to then be presenting your evidence and then clearly relating that evidence to your point that you stated in your topic sentence okay so a lot of students will just list a lot of evidence in their body paragraphs without then telling us this shows this evidence proves and um you know interpreting the meaning of in relation to your topic sentence uh, is what we're talking about when we're talking about making your ideas explicit, when we're talking about being really precise and accurate um, and, and meeting the expectations of academic English readers. And then we're thinking about conclusions and having that final paragraph or so that summarizes that central argument again in your key points that you've made in your body paragraphs and then broadening out stating the implications of your central argument. What does this mean in a bigger sense? What is the future of this issue? And if you do all those things, your reader is going to feel like they are in good hands and that's what you want, right? You want them to feel very comfortable and that this person is leading me through this, um, is taking me by the hand and leading me through this argument and convincing me and persuading me of their point. Okay, so let's think a bit more about how to do that and how to ensure you've done that after you've written a first draft and then thinking about uh, that editing process and what that um, should be like, some advice for how to through that process. So we don't just compose our first draft and send it off, right? We have to go through this editing process. So we have some suggestions of what that would look like, what should that, that could and should look like. So if we think about editing, we think about proofreading. So what is the difference there? Is that a different process? Sometimes people use that word interchangeably. Um, and perhaps they're not really sure of what the difference between those two words is, because there is a big difference actually between editing and proofreading. So we'll have a look at what that difference is, what we think that difference is. Editing is much more involved and is a much bigger process where you're improve, thinking about improving your argument, structure, and paragraphs, and then the, the expression, um, moving through the, that macro to micro. Whereas proofreading, there is some overlap, but proofreading is really something you do at the very, very end, where you're looking for those little tiny mistakes. But if you finish your first draft and then you go right to proofreading and just look for little tiny mistakes, you're missing a big chance to improve a lot more of your writing to really ensure that you've set out that argument and that structure that supports it and that those paragraphs are really clear and polished and the expression as well. So we'll go through those stages now, but just wanting to point out that proofreading is something that you do at the very end, the very, very final stage, um, and that there's a whole other process to go through if you're really interested in um, having your work shine and, and polishing your work. So this is that process like I've been um, discussing, thinking about argument first of all, then thinking about your structure, then paragraphing, then expression. We don't want to go right to expression and say, how are my sentences? How's my word choice? What's my vocab doing? Um, can I improve that? You don't want to do that first of all, because if you realize I need to change my argument a bit, I need to refine that. I've come up with a more sophisticated um, complicated way of expressing what I want to express around my argument and key message. Well, then that's going to kind of alter your structure a bit and that's going to alter your paragraphing. And so some of that expression that you might be working on changing won't really matter because you'll, you'll be making those higher level changes. So you have to work at the higher level first. You have to think about the macro leading down to the, ma the micro. And it's always about how the micro then leads back up to the macro, right? How does that micro the paragraphing, the expression, 
you know, it's all about how that can best support the macro. How does that support what I'm trying to do with my structure, which supports what I'm trying to do with my overall argument. So you are always thinking about that relationship between macro and micro, but you've got to start with the macro first. And then as you go down, think about how it builds back up again. How does this build back up again to support my big picture, which is your key message or your argument. So we'll go through these steps and some questions to ask yourself and some ways to look at these four different um, elements of the process in order to you know, really think about your work and go through this editing process. It is true that the expression part, even though we're saying it's the last thing to do, and in many ways it's the least important, there's the most that you can do with expression. There's a lot to actually think about when you get to that stage of expression. There's much that you can um, do to improve your expression. Once you're really sure you've got your parrot, your topic sentence is clear and the and the state and the evidence and your interpretation of it really clear, you know the structure, you've got your reasons really set out explicitly, and you've got a really um, sophisticated argument that you're putting forth, then your expression can really shine, um, but only at that at that point. And we'll go through a lot of ideas as well for there's a lot more ideas of how to polish that expression in particular. Okay, but as I said, have to think about argument first. You can ask yourself these kinds of questions. Is this thesis statement clear? Have you taken that position? If you're, um, yeah, does it answer the essay question? If you've been given an essay question, if you've um, asked your own question, you know, have you framed that question correctly in relation to your findings? You know, how, what is that alignment? Is that alignment working? Can you alter the question a little bit to better um, serve the findings that you've um, managed to dig up from your data collection. So asking yourself these types of questions will allow you to ensure that your argument is clearly put across and that it is um, then followed through in the structure. But other ways of thinking about editing for argument, your first level of the editing process, remember your objective to determine if the argument is clear, upfront, developed, and convincing. So is there an argument? Where is it? It should be in that first paragraph or that second paragraph. If you find it in the conclusion, that nice clear statement of your argument, then you've got some readjusting to do in terms of making that argument up front in the beginning of your essay, um, following those four moves of an introduction that I showed you before and we'll show you again. But first of all, seeing where that's placed, where is that argument placed? Is it clearly aligned with the question you've been asked or the question you've given yourself um, and, and developed and convincing? Okay, so again, this all sits within this broader idea of an introduction and the four moves of an introduction. As I said, you really wanna lead into that argument and make sure it's um, very clearly, you know, smoothly um, aligned with the content background, the problem issue, and then the argument and the signposting of reasons. Um, so you wanna make sure it's there when you're reading through that introduction again and you're checking for your argument. Is it there and how is it expressed? So look at an example. Um, I've got the, the link here. I'm gonna stop share and then show you on my other screen as a PDF. Um, an answer to this question. So let's think about this question in a European history course. In many ways, Mirabu, I'm not sure if I'm saying that name correctly, so forgive me if that's wrong. Um, their dream of a patriot king deriving his power from the love of his subjects was not so far-fetched. Do you agree? This is a nice question. Um, it's nice to look at as an example because because it's quite clear cut. Do you agree? Yes or no? So we know the options there. The student author, uh, we're expecting whoever is answering this question to you know, present an agreement or a disagreement position and put that forth. Some questions are harder and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, how to think about it when a lot of the questions you've been given or you give yourself maybe are not so straightforward, not so much a yes or no. And you know, thinking through, it's gonna take a little bit more time to think through how to answer those types of questions that aren't as straightforward. But first of all, we'll look at this more straightforward question. I'm just gonna stop share and then I will share again and hopefully this all works out well and you can see my next screen share. 
Hopefully that's good and you can see this colored, brightly colored um, essay. And um, you'll be getting, I, I can give you guys these slides, I can give Acre these slides and, and give them out to you guys and that will have the link in it. But this is the Academic Skills, ANU Academic Skills website under essay writing and we do have this annotated example there if you want to look at it in more depth. But looking at this example here, we see that's the same question and we, we know this got an HD and that they did follow the four moves of an introduction. Um, and I've highlighted them here, what those four moves are. So looking at the context, the French Revolution through um, Louis XVI and the Bourbon monarchy into crisis, what began as a push for a more consultative monarchy in the heady summer of 1789 spiraled out of control in the space of only four years, as events, personalities, and the king's own conduct conspired to make Louis hated by his own subject and robbed of his authority, his throne, and finally his life. Okay, they've given us that context. And they've written in quite a dramatic way. It's quite a dramatic time. So I think it called for that. Um, giving us two sentences there. One, two sentences of context. Okay, so keeping it short and brief around setting the scene of the French Revolution, this king, um, and what was going on with this king. Um, and, and how he, um, how the public felt about him. And then the issue or debate, the revolutionary politician an ardent constitutional monarchist, Mirabeau, envisioned Louis endorsing the revolution and its accomplishments, reigning as a patriotic citizen king and thereby winning the undying love of a grateful French public. This, Mirabeau fervently hoped, would ensure the survival of the French monarchy and simultaneously guarantee the gains of the revolution. So this is the debate or the issue of what, um, you know, Mirabeau was thinking and wanted to happen. So it's not the scholarly debate in this case. It sounds like with this question, um, perhaps it's not a deep scholarly debate, but they're setting up what um, what Mirabeau was hoping and then what they're arguing the reality was, what the real situation was. What I've got in blue there, Mirabeau's dream was an impossibility. Okay, so they've got a strong argument there. Do they agree? No, they do not agree. Um, and then the signposting of their reasons, Louis was unable to reconcile himself as a result of his worldview, his decreasing popularity, and the revolution's failure to compromise with the crown. So they've got all four pieces there quite succinctly. And you want to look back on your work or as you're composing and try to set it up in this way in terms of these four moves to allow you to really succinctly grab the reader in terms of understanding the context, understanding what the issue is here, understanding what your argument is really clearly and explicitly, and understanding what your reasons are. Okay, I'm going to stop share and then return back to my PowerPoint. Okay, here we are. Hopefully that's okay and everyone can see. I'm sure you'll let let me know if you can't see it. And then thinking about, like I said, trickier questions. You might have a trickier question where it's not so much a quote and then do you agree or disagree? It might be um, something that's less straightforward. And so in that case, you need to think a little bit more hot, more um, in depth, You know, take a bit more time to think about how are you going to frame this as an issue or a debate? Sometimes it's not easy to do, uh, but you've got to think about how to do it because your essays or your articles or whatever you're writing um, is not just a series of content information. Like your readers are not picking it up to learn from an encyclopedia entry about this topic. They're not in, um, innately fascinated by it like you are, let's say. They want to know what your project is and what you found. And they want to know what your argument is, what you're trying to persuade or convince us of. That's inherently more interesting than learning some factual information. So how are you going to frame that right away to show us this is what it's about, this is the issue. And then an issue is inherently interesting to us academic readers, right? We wanna know what that issue is. And then what do you think about that? Um, what do you think we should do? What is your take on that? What's your position or point of view? That's what we want to get to. You've got to think about how to make that work, even when the question is tricky, even when the question doesn't seem like a question at all, it seems more like a statement. And how can you think about that and reframe it as a question, reframe that question um, in your writing as, as an issue that you're then addressing and providing your point of view on. Some questions you devise for yourself and you might want to brainstorm 
that question with your colleagues, with your academic skills units to think about, have I framed this in the right way, in a way that I can answer, in the way that my data has revealed an answer in response to? Um, but, you know, thinking about those questions you devise yourself, think about how you can always reframe them a little bit if you find that what your answer is doesn't quite match or align. And that's the kind of freedom of devising your own question. So I just want to point out that often for HAS subjects, humanities, art, social sciences, um, if you're going for distinction, high distinction, you want to think about or, you know, even getting into an um, academic journal or presenting at a conference. Um, it's always going to be trying to get to that nuanced, complex sort of answer. It's still going to be a position. It's not just fence sitting, um, but but to get at the complexity, right? Not just um, X has many benefits and, you know, I'm just going to list all the benefits of um, of this particular thing or topic or idea I'm talking about. I'm going to convince you this is a good thing. Um, that's not quite nuanced or complicated or showing your real complex thinking. And we know it's also complicated and we know you've got all these complicated thoughts in your brain and it's about getting them out. And so how do you best do that? You want to try to really frame that complication in your argument. So those types of clauses that are up here, like a while or an although or a despite is going to allow you to do that. You're going to acknowledge these both sides, but still lean towards one position. So while X has many benefits, and we're, and we're not saying it doesn't, um, it's ultimately limited. And that ultimately shows that's where I'm leaning. I'm leaning towards those limitations. And that's really showing my complexity, my ability to, as a writer, my ability to get across, there are some problems, ultimately this is a problem, even though there are many benefits, right? Um, and that, that's gonna really show your nuance and your ability to, to think through a complex issue. And so framing it like that is what I really recommend um, to try to get you towards that higher grade mark you might be going for. If you're in a, a writer of STEM, science, technology, engineering, or mathematics, it's all, and you're doing that original research, um, and you, or you, you, know, you found something, you're, you're doing some data gathering and reporting on that, then your key message and the key messages that are Think, you know, getting you towards those higher grade bands are often going to be something like our findings show this and this has these implications. So it's not just the findings themselves and then you expect the reader to know what those implications are, to know what that means. It's more that you're telling us you found this thing, this kind of in the grand scope of things, small thing, but it has this meaning. It has this bigger meaning. Um, it suggests this. Um, it shows this bigger thing that connects to, you know, more of the discipline and a wider view. And then readers will say, oh, wow, that's really interesting. But if it's just the small thing, readers might not always get what, why that's interesting, why that's important, right? And so by showing us those implications, you show us why that's important or significant, um, what those implications are. And that's really key to your key messages for those types of subjects. Okay, so I've got a Haas example from English studies from um, our good friend at Academic Skills, Kate Oakes, who's a PhD student. So this is from a part of her um, section of her PhD. And this is about how to convey a complex argument. So let's um, go through um, this paragraph, but I've broken it up into some sentences and highlighted some important words to show how she's working through the complexity of what she's dealing with here. Um, around the novels of Thomas Hardy and her interpretation of those novels and his depiction of animals within those novels. Um, so she, her argument, I argue that the inconsistent representations of livestock farming and Hardy are best understood as expressions of two diverging perspectives on farms. Illustrating a fascinating conflict in ideology and artistic vision. So she's grappling with something complicated, right? She's grappling with a conflict in ideology and artistic vision. She's putting together two diverging perspectives on farms. Um, so that's not a real simple thing to get across, right? She's not saying Hardy is doing this with animals. She's saying this is really complicated what Hardy is doing with animals in his novels and how he's depicting them. And that's what's fascinating, right? The complex way in which we can interpret how he's uh, dealing with animals when we look at his life and his beliefs, and then how he puts that across in his novels. Wow, the fascinating conflict. Let's dig into that conflict. Um, and so then she explains that conflict 
Um, on the one hand, it's this. Hardy is a, a poet, humanitarian. On the other hand, he was pragmatic, utilitarian thinker. So getting into his background um, and the conflict within himself and then how that comes across in the novels. However, reading through Hardy's, um, you know, understanding Hardy's background, his more utilitarian look, uh, look on things. Um, you know, he's depicting farms as a place where harshness is a necessity for survival, um, all of these things about how, how we read his work. And then together, the novels illustrate farms as places of these connections and disconnections, kindness and cruelty. So putting it all together, we see that conflict in his novels. We see those two diverging perspectives in his novels. And that's what she's trying to step out in this introduction. Um, he's got this dissonant mode where he's dramatizing the discord between these two realities of these two diverging views as the, um, you know, more altruistic view and the more pragmatic view and how he puts that together. That's her interpretation, right? That's her argument that she's putting forth. Um, so this is discordant and striking, right? That's what makes it interesting. And she's showing us that. That's what makes us, makes his novels um, classic novels because of this discord is so striking. And his depiction of farms. And at the end there, I bolded that word, complications at play, when humans domesticate and use animals. So there's a lot to this, right? There's a lot to this argument. She says, I argue in the beginning, but it takes a while to really even explain um, the conflict that she's discussing and arguing for, and, you know, her interpretation of how that, um, how those diverging perspectives on farms play themselves out in a novel. So I thought that was helpful to have a look at how you might think about framing a complex argument, because that's what's, uh, what it's really about when we think about that first level of editing. Okay, now we can get on to structure. Um, is your argument sustained throughout the body of your essay? How are your topic sentences? You wanna think about topic sentences in two different ways in terms of the structure, how do they contribute to your argument? And then later with paragraphing, how do they frame the paragraph underneath? Um, but in this case, with the structure, how are they clearly connected to your argument statement? Little pieces of your argument. Are they in the best order? Is that a logical order? You know, you could be doing it somewhat in a linear fashion. You can be doing your most important points first, you know, but you need to decide on the best order for these things to go in for your reader. Um, Okay, so editing for structure. What do you want to do there? What questions do you want to ask yourself when you're thinking about structure? You want to ask yourself the questions on the previous slide, but also your objective, ensuring the structure is logical, flowing, signposted, always connected up, back up to our argument. So you want to check the um, introductory signposting and is that adhered to in your body paragraphs? And how, you know, how, are you how can you identify how the essay is structured? What is the structure? Is, do you think it's logical and convincing? It might be easy for you to say, yeah, of course it is. I wrote it. Um, you might want to give it to someone else for feedback to make sure. You might want to give yourself some distance from it so that you can come back to it as more of a, with fresh eyes, as, as a new reader might look at it as best you can to figure out um, how logical and convincing those topic sentences are as you read through. So with the example we just looked at with Mirabu's dream being an impossibility, and we've got these points that, that the student author goes through in terms of proving that this dream of, um, you know, Louis rising above the French Revolution and, and remaining the Patriot King uh, didn't work out. He couldn't be loyal to the revolution. He was alienated. There was a foreign war that accelerated his descent. The revolutionaries felt antagonistic towards any sort of monarchy and the people felt angry and dissatisfied by him. So all of that means um, Mirabu's dream of Louis being, you know, uh, continuing to be the king after the revolution was, was not going to happen. That was impossible, right? All these reasons really support that. So if you can do something like that and really point out, this is my main argument. These are clearly my points that I say in my essay. It's one thing to you say, yeah, these are my points, but you have to make sure they're there in your topic sentences um, because they might not be. You might be stating this as more factual statements, um, just telling us all about the foreign war and implying that um, that accelerated Louis' descent, but not really telling us explicitly. So you've got to you know, say all that explicitly and not just present us with facts and then presume that we can 
understand and put together how that logic works, how this factual information supports your point. You've got to state it explicitly. So if you notice your structure actually isn't very persuasive, what are you going to do? Um, you know, maybe you notice your, your argument or your important points are more at the end. Maybe you notice your points are actually repetitive, um, that um, some are really long and some are really short, um, that you've not really analyzed your evidence, like I've been saying, you just presented a lot of evidence, but you haven't really talked about why that's relevant or connected to your argument. What can you do? It doesn't mean you have to do a whole rewrite. It's more like you want to think about readjusting. You want to think about rewriting your topic sentences, you know, adding those sentences after your evidence. If it's just a string of evidence, you know, add those sentences in between so that you're um, pointing out then this shows and telling us why this evidence is actually important and, and putting in those analytical sentences. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean you have to do a whole rewrite, but a little bit of a rethink of maybe the order and some of the sentences and a reframing of perhaps the argument so that um, these things can align more persuasively. Okay, and then moving on to paragraphing. So if everything all is well, in the above of argument and structure, then we can move on to that deeper work of looking at your paragraphs. And that's when you can really polish, um, you know, have your work come across as really polished. But we, again, can't do that unless the argument and structure are really set out clearly. So checking on that topic sentence that it covers the main idea of what follows within that paragraph, then thinking about those paragraph units more, more carefully. Do they have too much evidence? Um, should they be split, perhaps? Are they actually covering two um, different points or reasons? Are you, you know, checking your referencing? How are you using sources? Are these quoted um, accurately? Are you citing correctly? So this paragraph structure, we have our beautiful hamburger metaphor to indicate um, the, the structure of a paragraph. So you want to think about that word count, 150 to 200 words, and have those solid, uniform elements of a paragraph. Um, rather than some are really long and some are quite short. That looks like, you know, you're not really sure about your points, um, that you haven't really thought it through carefully. It looks more informal. It looks more slapdash. So you have those more careful, properly developed units of 150 to 200 words that looks more um, appropriate and suitable for academic writing. So we've got that top bun of that topic sentence. Frame your main idea for that paragraph, your analysis and evidence as the meat, and your concluding sentence as that bottom bun. So we don't want to underdo it or overdo it. We don't want a really short paragraph that isn't very developed, but we don't want a really long um, paragraph that has too much evidence, too much um, analysis and we've lost the point. It's gone into too many different points. It's not digestible like this beautiful um, hamburger is quite digestible, whereas these other two, um, particularly the longer one, is not digestible. And you also don't want it to not have um, a top one. We need it to have that topic sentence. So that's also another problem. Okay, thinking about your paragraphs, that they are these links in a chain. So how are you going to show in your topic sentences, in your concluding sentences, how one merges, transitions into the next? That's something to think about when you're on this level of paragraph of editing, of the editing process for paragraphing, making sure those concluding sentences and topic sentences have that flow. So what do you do? What is your kind of questions to ask yourself, your objective for editing, for paragraphing? You want to make sure those topic sentences are working. Uh, the main idea is completely developed and supported. I was just reading a paper from a student. They had a nice topic sentence, but it actually wasn't what they were talking about in the paragraph. And the student had to decide, do I want to change this topic sentence or do I want to change and reframe some of the content? to match my topic sentence. And the student had to ask themselves, well, what is my idea here? What, do, what is my argument? And does, is my topic sentence the one that I want to put forth my argument? Or is it what I've got in the body paragraph? Um, so that's something you may need to get feedback on to really see for yourself. Um, but at any rate, it's a good skill to develop to be able to notice when your topic sentences is being supported by your evidence and ideas below, or if you're doing something else. So you want to ask yourself, 
can you tell what each paragraph is about? Are you just explaining something? Uh, is it clear what the point or argument is? Is the evidence, um, is the supporting evidence adequate? And can you spot, you know, having a look for anything that's getting too long or too short that looks too informal or too overdeveloped? Let's have a little look at this paragraph from our example one, noting the topic and concluding sentences. I've had to miss a little bit in the um, in the paragraph itself because the student, as its history, goes into um, unpacking some longer quotes from. Uh, writing from Louis and Mirabeau, but um, just looking at this topic sentence, think about how it does relate to the student's overall key message. Louis could not be loyal to the revolution, and for this reason, the dream of Louis as constitutional monarch could never become a reality. So, you know, reinforcing that language from their, um, from the question, from their key message argument statement in their introduction, the dream was an impossibility, um, the dream of Louis uh, as a monarch could not become a reality, you know, using that language again, showing us this is my idea for this paragraph, this is how it connects to my bigger picture. And then that concluding sentence, Louis could not fulfill Mirabeau's hopes um, as a king who was for the revolution. This had the added impact of ensuring he would draw the ire of the French public. So that makes it, that makes me think, oh, the ire of the French public, or public, that makes me think, oh, the next part, the next paragraph is maybe gonna be about the French public. And how they would never accept Louis as the constitutional monarch anyway, even though he wouldn't be good at it, is what this paragraph seems to be about. He wasn't interested in doing that because he didn't want to be loyal to the revolution. And the next point is, even if he was, the French public wouldn't be interested in supporting him anyway. Um, so leading us, that link, um, the chain link, leading us down into the next point about the French public not accepting him anyway. So just a note about using sources here, as we're thinking about paragraphs and within the body of the paragraph, um, we want to be able to indicate what your stance is. So when, you, when you're indicating, stating your evidence, um, you want to be clear about who's saying what, that you are putting forth what someone else is saying, and then your interpretation or your, your stance towards that work. Are you agreeing with it? Are you critical of it? Um, you know, we've got to make your attitude clear rather than you're just presenting all this evidence as fact. Maybe some of it is fact, you know, statistical information or whatever, but maybe some of it is interpretations of others, arguments of other scholars. And so you've got to make that clear of how you're interpreting their arguments. Are you just saying that's all very much true and you're, you know, you don't want to show that you're like a passive thinker. You want to show that you're a critical thinker, that you are actually saying I've chosen these arguments from these scholars for these reasons. And this is my stance towards this work that I am aligning myself with it or I am distancing myself from it. Um, and that's another way to polish your work and take your work to the next level when you indicate your stance, because a lot of students don't tend to do that right away. And so also your paraphrases, your quotes, your summaries, you've got to think about how you relate that to your point. Um, so that's a whole other topic around using sources, and we have a lot of resources about that that you can read further and watch videos on on our website, on our academic skills website at ANU. But I just wanted to point that out as well. So getting into expression, as I said, there's a lot to think about with expression once you get to this level. There's a lot that you can do to continue to polish your work. You want to think about if your sentences do indeed flow together. Uh, are they too long? Are they redundant? Um, should you create more variety? And then you get into a little bit more um, proofreading issues. But asking yourself these questions, having a good look at your expression at this stage. Your vocabulary choice, you wanna think about your choice of words, how they indicate your voice and stance, like I was just saying. You wanna to try to note any informal language. Again, getting feedback from others is helpful there if you're not sure what that might be. Being precise, like we said earlier, that's the expectation that you use really precise words. So not kind of vague words like vague pronouns or like nowadays um, words that don't really indicate, um, you know, with nowadays, which day, how long ago, right now, like what exactly do you mean by that? It's too vague as a word choice. Um, so being aware, you know, that we want this word choice to be as, you know, precise and accurate as we can, and that gives us confidence in your authority. We don't want cliches, 
we want to be as precise as possible. So again, with pronouns, like I'm saying, those can be, those are obviously helpful, but they can also be quite vague. So, um, you know, as much as you can, you want to use that concrete noun or concept to improve that clarity. Um, you know, pronouns are helpful. They can help you avoid repetition, but, you know, often the reference is unclear and then we feel really puzzled as readers. So you want to avoid beginning sentences with it or with this without um, following this with your concrete noun. Okay, so here's an example of someone just using it too much, right? This gets confusing. We have little idea by the end what it even refers to anymore. And maybe it's the same thing, right? They're all referring to this idea of companionate marriage. So you might want to just find other ways to say that phrase. Um, you know, I found three, uh, two other ways to say it. And then at the end, I repeat that term companionate marriage if you don't want to be repetitive. So just something to think about there. If you have a lengthy or complex sentence, you want to think about some strategies. You want to think about maybe splitting the sentence. Um, you want to maybe reduce your adverbs, adjectives, anything that's too like emotional that says, you know, this work is um, amazing or fascinating um, is, is probably not necessary. That's that's like a bit too emotive and therefore doesn't really fit with academic writing. Um, and as much as you can, you want to think about active voice, um, having the subject uh, next to the verb, the, the subject doing the verb and um, avoiding those turning verbs into nouns, just flattening your voice, making everything um, you know less active and less clear. Okay, so when we get to that editing for expression, thinking about how have we best used our clear, concise, appropriate language, not obscuring or confusing meaning. So you wanna ask yourself to find that emotive or informal language on any unclear pronouns. You know, how are you gonna, what is your strategy? How are you gonna fix this up? So you have that clearer, more precise word choice and have um, the, you know, avoid those pronouns and use your concrete nouns instead. And there's a lot more you can think about with expression that I'll run through for the rest of my time with you. Thinking about voice. So thinking about expression, not just as, is this grammar correct? Have I used the right word? That's important. Um, but think about the next level of your writing is when you think about your authorial voice, how you, how your language choice affects your voice and your style and how you, how you put yourself across as a scholar. So um, a, and a scholar named, a linguist named Ken Highland has said this, academic writing is not just about conveying your content, it's about representing yourself to gain credibility by projecting your identity. Um, you know, invested with authority, you wanna display confidence, in your evaluations and commitment to your ideas. Okay, so that's taking it to another level, right? Not just, oh, I'm just saying what I found, um, but you know, you're representing yourself as a scholar. You're trying to show yourself as a credible scholar. And how do you do that? Through your writing. So how are you gonna project that identity um, and that authority and your confidence and your commitment to your ideas? So that's what word choice can do when we get down to it. That's what expression does. That's what all of it does when we talked about argument, structure, paragraphing. Um, but really getting down to the word choice sometimes can do that for you, can show your confidence, your commitment to ideas. So that voice, what makes writing, you're writing yours, right? It's, it's personal um, and you wanna think about <clears throat> what makes it up. Um, it often has to do with how you refer to yourself, how you show your own voice throughout your writing, what, you know, what, your, what your stance is, what your attitude is towards the work that you've done, towards the work of others, that it's clear who's doing what, right? You're talking about other research, you're talking about your research, who's doing what here? This is research you've done, this is research someone else did, this is research you think someone should do. Um, is it a clear, is there a clear sense of your, your allegiance to certain, your commitment to your ideas? What are you aligning yourself with? What are you critical of? And are you there as the author in this writing? Or are you just explaining something as if it's more of a um, distanced encyclopedia entry? So all that will help you to uh, create more of a sense of your voice. So in order to do that, it's a big process. You're not just gonna do it maybe over the course of one essay. And you're already developing and on the road towards this, you want to be thinking about really understanding your disciplinary conventions and doing that deep dive, examining those models, those articles in your target journals, 
um, what is in reading for those those points, right? Where is their voice? How are they referring to others? How are they indicating their stance? And how can I do something similar using similar words? You want to be an advocate of your work. You know, it may be, oh, I'm just doing an honors. Oh, I'm, I've just found this. You want to really show this work is important, what I've done, and has these wider implications. And be that advocate of your work. If you don't believe in it and believe it's important, nobody else is going to. So how can you show in your writing you're that strong advocate of your work? You want to believe in yourself. You know, I've met many students who are just like, I don't know, I've got to make sure I'm doing the right thing. I've got to make sure I've evaluated everything correctly. And, you know, at some point you've got to trust yourself and believe that you've judged the work before you well and, you know, reasoned it through and that now you have something to say. At some point you have to stop and um, believe that and respect and trust your own judgment of this work because it's not up to your supervisors to say, yeah, that's definitely the way to go or definitely the right path. Like at some point you need to have that, that confidence yourself and display that confidence in your writing. So thinking about that, think about what, what do I think of my authorial voice? Do I think I could do more work on it? Um, or is it something I feel confident about? Um, how would you characterize this voice of yours? How do you think it could be improved? That's something to, to reflect upon, um, perhaps during you know, a longer break that you have in between, uh, in between projects. So thinking about style, again, that's the way it's written. That has to do with your word choice and your tone and how you uh, address your particular audience and how it suits your purpose. So all of that has to do with your style. And there's many ways to do it, but you know, it is important to think about then, like we talk about with writing for academic journals, you've got to think about what your who your audience is for that particular journal. Um, or, you know, if your lecturer tells you it's a particular audience that you're writing for in your essay topic, you've got to think about that as well. Um, and that's going to to potentially change. So I'll just run through these final slides around what Highland says regarding word choice and particular word choices you can use to um, you know, show your stance and engage your reader in various ways. So there are these frame markers where you signal intention. You know, we use these words, but think about how they really work and what they do for us when we see them. And there's some examples of when people have used these types of words to signal their intention. Um, a mood frame, what they're talking about for the purposes of establishing this um, a specific and testable definition. This is what I did. Okay, so framing it in that way. There's hedges, we use this a lot too, and that's good to consider when you use those. And when you want to actually pull back and say, um, I'm not going to categorically um, say that this, um, you know, I can't confidently say this is what it shows, but it might show, and perhaps it shows this, and, um, you know, how that might work for you, when you might make those choices to use those kinds of words. And that embeds respect for the reader, right? Um, but when these boosters are a bit different, they um, show that certainty, they emphasize something. So you want to use these as well to reinforce your authority, what you want to really boost in terms of your writing or finding, indeed, uh, likely and obviously. Your attitude markers, this is another way to, to express your um, certain appraisals of the work that you're looking at or your own findings. I found some there for unfortunately different ways to um, indicate your quote and use different reporting verbs. Um, it could be the more neutral state or proposes or notes or argues. All of those words um, help to add some variety, help the reader to understand what's coming next in terms of is this an argument? Is this a proposal? Um, and then these transition words are very important. I'm sure you use them all the time, um, but really thinking about using them deliberately to help lead the reader through your points. We've got some examples there of when they're used. You don't want to overdo it, but I think it's hard to really overdo it. Um, it's really a good idea to always uh, help the reader through these complicated points that you're making, and you can do that through these logical connective words. Okay, a few more there that I don't have examples for, and then here's um, a final paragraph where We've got these words used quite a bit, and it really shows if, um, you know, reading through makes the paragraph read a lot more smoothly and clearly when we've got these types of words, we've got these transition words, we've got these hedgers, we've got these quoting verbs. Um, 
it's really uh, helpful to read to understand the author's the student author's voice coming across where it's coming across how we read it how we understand their stance and how they align themselves with this other research that they're talking about as well as how they discuss their own findings okay so finally um then after all of that is done after you think about those four levels and you really deep dive into expression and you can do that in all those different ways we discussed then you want to go into proofreading and really ensure you know you, you meet those standards of formatting and referencing in the right style um, some strategies there you would want to read aloud you want to give yourself some distance um, if you notice you might be saying some words too often you know the find and replace can help you with that if you um, are leaning towards certain vocabulary choices and you want more variety doing this work you know really picking up on this stuff means you want to you know have really high attention so and concentration so small chunks with frequent breaks is very important allowing that time in between drafts and get someone else to help and when you do ask someone else for help you've got to be very clear about what you want as you can see now that you know about the levels of editing what level are you at and what level do you want this person to give you feedback on right you don't want them to then say you missed a uh, full stop here and your arguments missing um you know you want them to think about what particular level um i'm just wondering how well my argument and structure are working don't worry about any typos or expression or anything like that right you want to give them that advice um <coughs> and it's a really good thing to do uh, non-experts can be really good they won't be distracted by your content so they can really um, show you where you're being clear and where you're not being clear Okay, and that's it from me. If you have any questions, please let me know. And yeah, it's a big process. It takes some time to get through this editing process. You, so you want to give yourself enough time to do it, really. Um, and admit, and perhaps really think about this process as you're composing so that maybe the process itself of, of editing and revising isn't as onerous. Um, but this is what you really want to be thinking about when you're editing and polishing your work going through these four stages.